welcome back to another Franchise Friday podcast. I am Melissa Pang here at The Entrepreneur Source, and I am joined today by Roger Ewart from America's Swimming Pools. Welcome, Roger. Thanks, Melissa. I appreciate you having me on. I really appreciate it. This is a, this is a lot of fun. I'm very excited for our conversation today. You are a wealth of knowledge, always providing value, and just overall great to work with. So thank you. Um, before we jump into general, you know, before we jump into talking more about franchising and America's swimming pools and all of those good things, can you give us a little bit of background on where you were before your current role? And you've had a lot of different roles in a lot of different industries. Um, but what are maybe some of the things you've done that have really led you to where you are today and really allow you to bring a lot of value to um, your current your current role. All right. Well, that that's uh, that's a that's a long story. So I'll keep it as brief as possible. But thanks for the question. Um, so I'll just start about 11 years ago when I was in corporate America as a director of operations for a company. I kind of saw the, the Titanic getting ready to sink. Um, I was that guy who had a little bit of foresight. I had saved up some money in my 401k, decided to cash it out and start a business. Uh, that business, uh, which is in sunny Florida, uh, broke even on month two, never looked back since. That was 11 years ago today. Uh, but in, in that same time period, I entered franchising. I kind of fell in love with the franchise model, although that was not franchised. I developed and created that business from scratch, ground up, and launched it, everything from marketing, you name it website development and physical build out of the actual retail store, uh, you know, because I just happen to have those skills and I and enjoyed working uh, in those capacities. And then also uh, all the buying, et cetera, pricing, materials, vendors, you name it, and got that up and launched and running. Uh, and it's just doing great, kicking along to this day. Um, and entering franchising about 11 years ago, I was uh, uh, brought in as a director of support um, because I'd done some business owner coaching. I had about 300 owners that I coached in the previous uh, career that I was in as uh, a director of operations training. And so I used those skills to help um, bring in new franchisees and to train them and get them up to speed, franchise university, uh, onboarding, and uh, coaching them to success, financials, you name it, you know, the whole schmear of director, directing a support team as well as supporting franchisees directly. Then went into um uh, promoted into a business development role as well as strategic partners. So helped negotiate all the vendor resources, rebates, and so forth for the franchisor, um, as well as uh, develop um, a future, future business for the franchisees. Moving on, um, offered a role that was a vice president of operations over 800 franchises in 32 countries. That was probably the most responsibility I've ever had, and it was a lot. Uh, a lot of great lessons there, um, some hard ones, but mostly all good. And I really learned what to and what not to do in franchising. Um, my Identify what's so special about your brand. It's not just about um, your systems. Uh, it's not going to be just about the fact that you've got uh, uh, more white space than the other person. It's about your operations team. It's about your support, your training, and all these other things uh, uh, that you have implemented along the way um, that really create flawless execution for your franchisees, right? So if you're, and I'll go through a little bit of the 
what I see as trending in franchising in a bit, but um, how, how you build up that franchise and how you compare yourselves to other franchisors, uh, which is a, a direct comparison model if you're working with a TES coach, which are absolutely wonderful to work with. Obviously, they're perhaps showing multiple brands and hopefully not in the same vertical as yours, but that may happen. And you have to have some differentiators. So identify your differentiators right away. Uh, your strength will come from that and the financial performance of your actual franchise owners, period. Uh, everybody wants to make money. If you can't prove that these people can make money, you've got a pretty tough road paved ahead of you. So you've got to figure that component out. If you have corporate stores, if you're just starting out as a, a fledgling franchise system, just getting into franchising, you're going to have to prove those corporate store profitabilities, back out anything uh, that would be uh, owner related and include any fees that the franchisee would have to pay. So their profitability is a net uh, uh, truth of what you're, you're able to produce. So long story short on that one. So going, I'll go more into depth on that later. Um, what makes what I do at ASP America swimming pool company uh, unique in this industry? Um, I think it's my approach on the process. I am uh, obviously recently at heart an ops guy. So I don't approach franchise development the same way a salesperson would. Uh, but have the sales skills, obviously. So I look at things, and I was that guy who, when I had a lot of franchises, uh, you know, I was handed from the development team people who are not, uh, as a director of support, et cetera, operations, handed people who are not uh, fully educated or, or woefully unprepared to actually launch their franchise. And that was kind of disenchanting uh, of, the, of, you know, getting those people from the sales team uh, off the logistics, real estate, whatever they may be doing. Um, it was frustrating for the team and the franchisee struggled, my team struggled, and uh, the salesperson got their commission. Well, that didn't sit well with me. So I decided when I was going to get back into development, I'm going to do it right or I'm not going to do it at all. Um, so incredibly well prepared, my candidates will end up being. Um, they are coming up with full business plans, pro formas, the whole gamut. And I, I set them up to challenge uh, many, many challenges along the path. I think one of the hallmarks of what I'm doing differently. And my, my ops team will say it out loud to anyone. They appreciate everything I'm doing to fully prepare because they're launching uh, so much stronger and faster. And, you know, somebody said at one point, I don't know that that's scalable. You can't really keep that going. And I said, well, you know, I'm a quarter Scottish, so you don't tell a Scotsman you can't do something or he'll prove you wrong every time. Um, and the, the Italian comes out and he's really passionate. So uh, you know, I, I looked at that and said, this is a great challenge. So for two years running now, um, we've seen double digit unit economic growth uh, using my plan of that full preparation. The operations team, of course, loves me because uh, they're getting a franchisee who's really ready to go. And they're saving them a lot of time and a lot of heartache and, and trouble. And honestly, that's a great feeling to me. So that's what I call responsible franchising. And I'll talk more about that later as well. Uh, with ASP in particular, this brand uh, is an essential services brand, so it, it won't be shut down. Number one, if anything ever happens again, like it has happened in the last few years of our lives, which is horrible. Don't ever want to see it again. Uh, don't even want to participate in that again, as anyone wouldn't want to. Um, and also, it's recession resistant. The attorneys say we can't say recession proof, and that's true. Okay, It's recession resistant. And so we went through the last uh, economic downturn at 08, 09. And uh, our franchisees were not horribly uh, at affected, adversely affected by that on a financial basis. So with that, it, it brings me great confidence in order to say, hey, you're you're presenting something that's really a terrific uh, insulated brand to the mo most uh, that I can possibly present to you. So it's a central service uh, brand that uh, uh, will continue to feed uh, your 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 clients. Uh, if you're a TES coach listening to this or if you're a franchisor. Uh, think about your model and how um, effective it will be to, you know, if you're awarding a franchise, you have this partner who's invested a ton of money in your business. Are they going to survive a downturn? Right. And, and that's uh, your responsibility as the franchise or to ensure that they're going to see it through. Um, so ASP is the leading um, uh, pool franchise maintenance, uh, cleaning, repair, service, uh, renovation and construction franchise in our space. We've got approximately 389 units established with over 140 owners at this point. I see it as having about 200 more, maybe 250 more units to go. And then I'm going to take the brand international as the goal. Uh, so we're looking forward to doing that. Um, and that's uh, that's coming sooner than later. Um, you know, the, the, the unique thing about uh, this brand, it's on two and a half acres, 
you know, 13 pools, indoor training. It's a massive facility with a ton of trainers, people, support, four people in marketing at the brand level alone, not even speaking about authority brands power with their, uh, you know, very powerful marketing machine that they have, which is our, our parent company. Uh, mm -hmm. And it owns 12 uh, brands, which are all home service brands, by the way. So our franchisees can also uh, look into partnering with our other local franchise uh, companies that we own and uh, and trade those customers back and forth. So I think that's a, another thing that makes us stand out from the crowd. Um, systems, of course, you know, we have our own proprietary software. We don't use a third party, so we control completely what the software does. There's no uh, third party that's selling the same exact platform or being used by our competitors. So that's not a one-to-one -one. and so you know carve out your uniqueness i think is what the uh the story is here so i think um that helps to define a little bit more about asp and why um it's, it's unique and i and i also want to reflect upon what i love so much about working with tes and 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 so forth and number one melissa number two jackie number three the coaches and um uh melissa you can you can you know buy me a glass of wine next time we see you but no i'm kidding um I, I just think uh, you folks are terrific. I love the approach of the coaches, the educational approach. You're, you know, um, you know, really want to educate them thoroughly. And and as an ex ops guy, that kind of speaks to my heart because you really truly want to serve the best interest of of the client, which ultimately will serve the best interest of the franchisor. So, with that being said, um, you know what I see for franchising coming forward, obviously the direction of, of franchising in general, I like to talk about, uh, first of all, the life cycle of what I'm seeing a trend in the last 10, 15 years. So what's changed in franchising over the last 10 years? 4,000, 5,000 more franchise concepts. That's the big thing that's changed, right? We've wow. also seen, uh, you know, franchise sales organizations. We've seen private equity insert themselves into franchising. Yeah. Uh, referral networks such as TES, uh, coming in uh, and so forth. And so, you know, as that relates to really when we're talking about the life cycle of a franchise or let's just pretend for a second you're a, a company that wants to franchise and you're a fledgling, as I would call it, uh, you're, you're literally just out of the egg and you've got maybe a few corporate units, maybe a couple of franchise units and you're really getting on to, OK, I want to mm -hmm. get serious about this. And then you turn into a, a micro emerging. You may be scooped up by a a, a private equity firm, or not a firm themselves, but a, a multi-brand franchisor who is looking to de help develop develop you, more than likely you'll probably be in the emerging area if that should happen. Um, some pros and cons there. Obviously, founders, I'll, I'll speak to you about that. Obviously, you're going to give up uh, a piece of your equity or your equity position uh, and most likely have a, a buyout, right? And so you'll get about half of your money and then half later when you hit your goal in about two years or so. So keep those things in mind when you're negotiating those kind of terms and, and conditions with uh, any any multi-brand franchisor who's looking to acquire you obviously um you know and as you grow uh through uh, that emerging area you then start to mature and i see that as about 50 to 60 units and you're you're not depending upon any franchise fees any longer for hand to mouth uh, to keep your franchise system going you ultimately shouldn't be looking at needing franchise fees uh, really other than for building the business uh, and so forth and getting more people, more operational uh, past about 40 units. And, and that's my sole opinion, by the way. Everybody has a different opinion on that. When you get to about 100 units, that's when you become mature, in, in my mind. Um, most franchises don't make it past 20 units. So if you can get past 20 units, you're on the right track. If you're struggling, you can't get past that 20 unit point. That's when you need to reach out to these multi-brand franchisors to see if there's somebody who may be interested in, in uh, partnering with you. If you kind of run out of gas, if you will, and, and you need that expertise and that help to get to the next level, whether it be operational, uh, you know, the sales systems that they've got, uh, systems in general, uh, vendor relation, negotiation power, because that's a big thing that uh, Authority Brands offers is, is that ability to have uh, 12 brands, 1,000, you know, franchises under our belts so we can negotiate terms on things that most people can't in a single small franchise um and then past that point i think about two to three hundred you're in what's called in my mind a legacy business in a franchise mm -hmm. that's when you're kind of the bee's knees in the business and you're like what's next uh and that's when you can look at going to uh to multi-international whatever you want to do um 
you know, master licensed partners in, in foreign countries, et cetera, which can be very tricky. And I know enough about that. If anybody wants more details, reach out to me privately. I'll share the good, bad, and the ugly there. Um, and area development, uh, which there's also pros and cons mm -hmm. behind those things. So I hope that helps to, to um, paint a little bit of the, the what I see in franchising um, in the trends. And, you know, as far as the, the future, what I see, you know, one, three, five, ten years down the road, I actually see potential PE held brands possibly going back private and or perhaps going public, interestingly enough. Why um, is that? I, I think it's it's a trend right now. And I think I, I think that there's going to be some breaking off of that. I think that other interest groups are going to start seeing uh, that conglomerates don't always work to the best interest of the whole, right? And that sometimes more focused energies for that one company to develop may be best. There's pros and cons behind it because, you know, the larger an organization gets, the hairier things get. Mm -hmm. uh, no matter what organization you're talking about, whether it's IBM or GE or any of these big companies, and people just get lost in the mix, right, when there's thousands of people. So there's that component. Whereas a uh, you know, a founder listening to this who's just started, had his franchise, just emerged, and he's got up to two to 300 units or whatever he or she may do, um, they feel like, you know, wh where did this thing come from? And why, why, what did we lose along the path? What did we have to sacrifice or acquiesce on or give up in order to get to that next level? And, oh, boy, do I want these components back? And a lot of people have that. Uh, and, and it could just be an exit of a founder at that point and say, okay, adios, you guys have this and take my baby and, and uh, go go marry it off to somebody else at this point, right? And that, and that does happen. So there's all different paths that people can take. Yeah. Questions? So <laughs> I have, again, like I said at the beginning, you are a wealth of knowledge and I would love to pick your brain about all of these topics. A few things that I wanted to touch on. Um, you mentioned responsible franchising, which I think should become a trending uh, phrase because in that vein of, you know, we're talking private equity and different groups, and there's a lot of different paths that a franchise can take, a franchise zor can take to grow, but which one is going to be right for the brand? And also within that franchise, how are you taking the responsibility to grow the right way? Because at the end of the day, it's not just a franchise and a company, you're bringing in individuals who are putting oftentimes life savings on the line right. and you're asking them to invest in your brand. Mm -hmm. What are you doing to, again, responsibly grow so they grow with you? And that's where you see these success stories come, but where can you, how can you have more of that? So I don't know if you want to say anything more about that responsible franchising piece, but I want to mention yeah. too, just the fact that we work so well together, our two um, networks, is you take that, the first call that you have with the candidate is education. You're prepping that, like, it's not like the relationship as a franchisee starts when they get passed off to the operations Absolutely. team. It starts with the sales team, the development team. And then I would take that a step further and say, that relationship starts with our coaches. They're starting to nurture them, figure out their why, their pain points, their motivators, where they are, where they want to go to, and then they bring them to you. You continue, you know, so it's this whole, it's not just these starts and stops and transactional things. I, I 100%. Um, you're, you're spot on, Melissa, and, and uh, people need to listen to that more, quite frankly. Um, and I'll, I'll just reinforce everything you said with maybe a little different color mm -hmm. or added color to it, if, if you're okay with that. Perfect. Um, so, you know, again, speaking to franchisors, man, develop your franchises responsibly. I, I coined that phrase here at Authority Brands, and if you want to go and repeat it, feel free. I don't care. I don't own it, but I, uh, I'm proud to have, to have brought that to, to any any franchise that I've been with. Um, you know, and, and my, my, my golden rule or quote that I'll give you is don't ever chase uh, a dollar or a person. Chase the right thing and the people and money will come to you. That's my advice. So education is the key, okay? A couple different levels I'm going to talk about at the franchisor level and at the candidate level. Um, you know, I do a heck of a lot of preparation on the candidate level from the development team. Demand from your development team that this goes on. 
It's not complex. It, get them into the ops people's roles, make them go through what the day in the life of an ops mm. person at the franchise or level is like, and send them out into the field and work with the franchisee. Make them understand a day in the life so they can truly bring people along to your ops team that are going to be the right fit, number one. Number two, they're going to be really fully prepared and have complete buy-in. There's no meet your team day will be decision day, not meet your team day for, for giggles, right? Uh, and, and you know, then on the franchisor side, um, in, in, in the light of education is key here, Melissa, um, for franchisors, go get your CFE if you're a franchise executive. I am not being paid by IFA to say that. I'm telling you right now, it was a life changer for me in my career. <clears throat> pay for it through your company and pay for it for your people in anyone in a management role in your company. You're going to see a great transformation. Make that investment in your people. And that's my, my advice. I love that. I, and uh, disclaimer on this, you're hearing it here. I still don't have my CFE and I, I've like completed it partially and I need to do that. So thank you, Roger. I'm now going to go finish that up. But great. Uh, education being key. Um, and I like that you split it into the two parts. It's not just candidate education. It's also franchisor education. So um, going back to Ops and development, ops and sales oftentimes develop or just work in silos. It's like, hello, yes, right. all like all the time right. in our own company, you know, you're saying sales team is saying this and ops team is saying this right. and caught in the middle are often the candidates or the clients or whoever it is confused. And right. so I think that's an excellent point um, right there. And then also on the franchisor side with education. I would add to that in light of what we're talking about, the future of franchising, how brands are going to be growing, where that's going. Um, take time as a franchisor to educate yourself on the different ways to develop your brand. Again, the right way. Every brand is different. It's not, you can't just look at one franchise that's taken off and, you know, sold 300 units in one year and say, whatever they did, I'm going to do that. You, you just don't know everything else that's going on in there. And I don't know if you want to speak any more to that, but educate yourself. No, it's, it, it's very poignant. And I can tell you right now, you know, you, you hit on a, a, a keynote with me, which was uh, ops versus sales. Remember I've been both guys. Yep. Okay. So isn't that fun, right? You're not going to find a freak in nature like that you should <laughs> no. or do it both roles, which is why i'm encouraging everybody to go do both roles yeah right um or make your teams play that nice together so there's a very important point here and by the way have your operations people try to sell a franchise right okay <laughs> good luck with that right now everybody in operations sells for a living why they have to convince somebody to do something that they typically naturally wouldn't want to do i.e a franchise following a plan and doing this meticulously right so they're really all they're all in, in, in influencer roles, I call them, not sales, but influencer roles. Mm -hmm. um, so the reason for young franchisors in which you're failing to develop, if you are failing to develop, is the that you don't have an understanding of how to make that dot connect, mm -hmm. right? You're not forcing your team members to play along nicely without somebody complaining so badly that they want the other person gone, whatever else. No, you kids will play in the sandbox together. We're going to build a sandcastle together, and this is what it's going to look like. And so um, it's, 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 you have to look at them like, like children in not a child sense, but in that the, you're grooming, you're mentoring, you're guiding, you're coaching, you're training uh, your, your people. And I think if you start there with your people, that will lead right down to the people that PES bring to you as they enter your system. And that seamless transition from handoff from ops or from sales or development to ops will occur. And you're going to be a much happier franchisor. I hope everyone was taking notes because just in this like what 20 minutes i feel you've dropped some some gold nuggets here um and what was the other thing i wanted to say um mm, i lost it hold on hold on while i bring it back <laughs> it's gone <laughs> <laughs> it's okay Oh man. Um, but when, okay, so I'll, I'll just reiterate this as well. And again, why 
you, Roger, and America's Swimming Pools and the Entrepreneur Stores have worked so well together is when you were talking about unique differentiators and what sets you apart in your industry, in franchising, you didn't talk about features and benefits. You didn't talk about, well, we use this type of equipment. We use this type of uniform and this type of vehicle um, and all these things. That's important, but those are the details. It's about those, the differentiators where your support, your training, how are you Culture, helping your franchisee, right. all these different things. We have something that we, we say ILWI, income, lifestyle, wealth, equity. What are your brand differentiators around income, lifestyle, wealth, equity? It's just another way of looking at it. Um, but what are your differentiators around those four key components? Because that's what we talk to the clients about. What are your goals? So if a franchise can then say, these are my differentiators, this is how I can help you meet your goals sure. around these four things, then it, it really does like match up. Right. And what are we doing here long term? Right. That's that's the big yeah. reason we're doing this. They're investing in this to get a return. They don't just want to be your franchisee for the next 150 years. Right. right. That's not real, realistic. We're doing 10 year agreements typically here um, on, on average. And, you know, and, and two things uh, I don't want to forget to talk about processes, clear processes. Yeah. That was very important. Right. So something um, I'm a checklist kind of guy. Right. Dad was uh, Navy. So I grew up with checklists on the fridge. I joked with you about that earlier before this and you know every boy had a chore and you did it here and you checked it off here and you got dessert if you finished right every day um so um i present every candidate with a checklist that's like super clear they're educated adults i'm not going to insult their intelligence they self-grade as they go mm -hmm. right um but it's a great indicator if you don't have that that you're probably not very organized and the first impression you're giving from your your um development person is not of great organization so how does that translate into the future of your franchise so have clear processes that you lay out mm -hmm. i think that's a, a key component excellent um again um i'm gonna wrap this up but so many good just pieces of information for a franchisor i think in any stage and i know we only touched on you know the different stages of fledgling to micro emerging to emerging and of course we can get more into detail people can reach out to you um individually I uh, two my two final questions for you. Um, one, where can people find you? And two, what would you recommend? What's like a book or podcast, or even just if you want to finish off with a quote for the people? Yeah, I'm throwing this Whoops, in there. Let's see. You wanna... I don't. Yeah, not sure if you have a book <laughs> recently. Um, I think one of the best books. I am a, a CFD, as you know, and I give back to franchising in that I, I actually help oversee uh, the CFE courses now, the testing. Awesome. And I think one of the best ones that I, that I had taken um, was, uh, uh, actually, I think I had the book right behind me. Let's see if I can find it. For those who aren't watching, Roger has a massive bookshelf behind him. Let's and see if we can find this. Kind of he's going to find the book, this life-changing book that we will so, all be ordering off Amazon. Greg Nathan, great guy, mm -hmm. awesome Australian accent. He was a rather bitter franchisee that turned into a franchisor. Uh, great guy, profitable partnerships. Amazing. I think that's a good one for all franchisors to read. A little bit leaning toward the franchisee perspective, but that's okay, right? You gotta, you yeah. gotta, uh, you know, see all sides of it. I think that's a really valuable one. I've got so many books up there. I don't know even where to where to begin with them. As far as franchising is concerned, I think that's one of the better ones uh, that I think every franchisor should read uh, in, in their, their path to it. Um, that was a book. What, what else? What, what was the other question? I'm sorry. Well, the, other, the other one was uh, just where can we, where can people find you? LinkedIn, oh, where can they find me? website. Um, they can look me up on LinkedIn. I have two profiles. The one with the million connections is the one that's uh, my, my real one. I just have one that, uh, it's for folks that want to abuse me on LinkedIn. <laughs> so if you ever if you want to heckle get... Roger, go find his no channel. If no, you want no. to see what he's actually done and, and follow along with his accomplishments, go to the, the million follower one. Yeah. And, and you know, if you do want to send a connection request, please put a note in there. Don't just send the request. If I don't know who you are, please just send me a simple note. Saw you on the uh, podcast with Melissa. Love to connect. And I'm happy to 
talk with you anytime. Uh, no. Yeah, Roger still hasn't person. answered my Connect request. So good luck out there, everyone. I'm oh, that's kidding. not true. <laughs> uh, I'm just yeah. kidding. You, I, you are an absolute joy to work with, Melissa. You really are. I really envy our relationship. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Roger. America Swimming Pools is lucky to have you. Thank you so much for joining me today. All right. Take yeah. care.